Coming up on Tech News Today, the Droid X is out, and it's thin and beautiful. Also, in Japan, they're trying to scan your gender and your age to deliver you better ads. And Sandwich Cowboy tried to warn Apple. Why didn't they listen? Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, July 15th, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by our boss, Leo Laporte, who takes all his salary from your donations. If you'd like to tip Leo, go to twit.tv, scroll down to the tip Leo section on the left. Give till it helps. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. And I am Becky Worley. And I'm Dr. Kiki. Behind the board is our incredulous producer, Eric Lanigan. Hey, guys. How are you? I mean, incredible. <laughs> he, he's not incredulous. He's both. <laughs> he's maybe both. Uh, this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day along with you and try to make some sense of it all. And the big news today, Droid X is out. It's Ooh. Droid X Day. It arrived. Yes. That Verizon says it's been a very popular launch. Um, I contacted them, dir- them directly, and they said they are sold out in certain locations, but not all the way around the country. Um, people can still order phones and expect them to be shipped on or before July 23rd, but it has been very successful. Successful with lines and they, you so know, they the did whole... sell. It. They said, "Oh no, there's going to be plenty," but they did sell out in a bunch in of locations. Su- in some locations, yes. And uh, we have the Droid X here. Our incredulous producer <laughs> is going to be our hand model. You can see it in the dock where uh, it nicely reclines to be your. It's a big screen, but it's thin. I like the way it feels in your hand. Four point three inch screen. Um, it's very um, cool looking. It has HDMI out and it's comes docked. with the cable. Um, which the Evo didn't. It's very Evo-like, the Evo from Sprint. Um, It also acts as a Wi-Fi hotspot, although it's not 4G. It's a 3G phone. Um, 8-megapixel camera, records 720p video, has the whole animated screen thing going for it. That's very cool. And as with other Android phones, you have all the apps. Uh, Google today announced that they have 70,000 apps in the Android store. Um, Just a little sidebar. This phone has a 1 gigahertz ARM V7 processor, 8 gigabytes of storage space, and check out the physical buttons along the bottom. So see those right down where um, Eric's hand is? Those are actual, you know, physical buttons that you depress um, as opposed to virtual buttons, and I like Mm. that a lot. Um, It doesn't have a front-facing camera like the Evo does, um, and the big question that remains with this is what the battery life will be like. That's been the complaint about the Evo given the 4G, given the huge screen, and that's something that's only really borne out over time. So the Droid, it's here, Droid X. Now it does uh, apparently have the possibility that it might self-destruct if you mod it. At least some <laughs> people are saying that uh, if eFuse fails to verify, that's the firmware information, uh, the kernel information and the bootloader version, then eFuse receives a command to blow the fuse, resulting in the booting process becoming corrupted. Other people are saying that's overstating it. Uh, Boy Genius Report uh, says that the eFuse was on the Milestone and the original Droid, and you were still able to uh, easily root the the original Droid. Uh, milestone was a little more difficult, so they're saying at worst, probably the Droid X will just be as difficult as the Milestone to root. So you're saying it's overstating it that the phone will physically explode into flames yeah, and blow it up. it would definitely be overstating it to say that. Okay, but yeah. possibly it could be bricked yeah. and yes. restored with a firmware update, but you'd lose all your data. Yeah, you'd lose everything. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, I would, as with all these things, if you want to jailbreak or, or root any kind of phone, you wait until the hackers, or if you're one of the hackers, you get in there and you, you work on it until it's done and then once it's it's done, then you start risking your actual phone. Let's just right. celebrate launch day before you're jailbreaking it, okay, Tom? It's a it's a good <laughs> phone from Verizon. Come on, man. But it's here. We must break it. <laughs> you know, and it's funny though. Yeah, I, I, was it you, Doctor Kiki? You pointed like yeah. it's an open source operating system. Yeah, it it is open source, and so the idea that it would be that the uh, provider would be 
locking it down in some way, I think is kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, it's it, that's why people have to root. They're not rooting it for the same reason they jailbreak an iPhone. They yeah, I mean, this because is of the, the restrictions put by the carrier. But this is a great phone. I mean, if you want to jailbreak the Dare or some other crappy phone from Verizon back in the day, please. I mean, I know people who are still <laughs> desperate for that. But this, I mean... Yes and no, of course. Curiosity is a great thing and makes for interesting times. I'm but... rooting for the rooting. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. That's, we won't is take... it a reason, though, to go back to Verizon if you're, if you're on another I... carrier, another provider? I can't even tell you how many people ask me yeah. the whole, what's the good phone from Verizon? I was just you know, in New York, and all the people that I was working with there are like, should I wait for the iPhone on Verizon or not? And so I was talking to them a lot about the Droid X. And this is a good phone if, yeah. you're, if you want a phone now and you don't want to gamble and wait till, who knows, holiday 2010, Q1, 2011. This is the now Seven phone months. from Verizon. Yep. Google also uh, put out their earnings right now. And when I say Google also because the Android, of course, Google's operating system. And uh, they're great, but not a great enough. <laughs> Google's second what quarter more? revenue was up 24% compared to last year. But the company missed analysts who wanted it up even more. And it's not been, you know, given the run-up on the Google stock over the past few years, this hasn't been the greatest year for them, but the earnings were decent. They also had a few other things that they shared in the call, one of them being the 70,000 apps for the Android marketplace, up from 30 in April, 30,000. My favorite factoid, people spent 4.8 million hours playing Pac-Man on the Google main site when it was up for, what, a day, a two days? <laughs> what a time suck. Yeah. There, there have been uh, whole doctoral theses started on that yeah. event, I have a feeling. <laughs> iOS 4.0.1 has hit the iPhones uh, today, earlier today. I downloaded mine and got the newer, thicker bars that tell you your reception. <laughs> uh, Eric did not update his yet for the, for the sake of science so that we could take a look at them. And you can tell mine's there on the right. I have two less bars than him, even though we're right in the same place. Sometimes that happens naturally, but I have a feeling it's the new calibration system that shows you more accurately how many bars you have. And you can see they're thicker, definitely on the, on the left side and a little taller as well. Great. So there you go. There's your big fix, right? The bars are thicker. Yeah. And now you'll have a better idea of the, uh, I guess, coverage, the AT&T coverage that you're missing out on. You will have a little that more. That you're lacking yeah, in little... certain areas where you thought you had coverage that now you're like, oh, it's really not so great. You know, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but this whole bars miscalculation, as of now, the bars are dead to me. I just, <laughs> I know they're lying them. to me, so yeah. the bars, you're dead to me. <laughs> You had a kid lie to me once, but you won't lie to me twice. Right. <laughs> I don't care how thick you are. Bars. Also, uh, iPad got a 3.2.1 update, right? That's right. I right. did the uh, upgrade for my iPad and improved Wi-Fi connectivity, which is going to be a good thing. Uh, fixed an issue in PDFs, copying and pasting them. Uh, something that made video playback freeze. They fixed that. And more reliability using the dock connector and the VGA adapter. They also added Bing to Safari's search options. So... Ye old iPad has been upgraded. Of course, if you haven't heard, tomorrow uh, Apple will be holding a press conference. All they've said is that they will be discussing iPhone 4. Obviously, the big thing discussed with iPhone 4 is the antenna issue. Uh, according to Brooke Carruthers, there is an analyst named Ashok Kumar at Rodman and Renshaw who says there is a mechanical fix. In the works, Apple has instituted a design fix for the iPhone 4 that more adequately insulates the transceiver module. Uh, and whether that will be what they announce tomorrow and whether there's a trade-in plan or you just bring it in and they swap it. There is a word you have not used here. What's that? Recall. Oh, no. Mm. Apple will not use that word either. You can, you can count on it. They will not call this a recall. Even if it is... 99% on the way to a recall, they will never, they will never use that the word. The phone still works, though. Exactly. I mean, the phone is not broken. There are a bunch of people complaining about, I can't touch my phone and blah, blah, blah. You know, when you could just, uh, there are easy fixes for it. It's, I don't, I, honestly, recall, really? Recall is not recall? exclusively used for broken, though. No. I mean, recall is whenever there's something significant enough that's pervasive throughout the entire product that it needs fixing. And I think yep. um, the bigger point to me is Consumer Reports not being able to endorse this and then three days later, this press conference being announced, I see those two things as corollary. This is recognition mm -hmm. that the mainstream consumer knows there's a problem. We need to take action because this is a PR debacle. So I think you're right. Recall is not the word they will use, but 
something's going on. And I think it's interesting. A friend of mine um, sent me an email saying that he delayed, that he had ordered an iPhone 4 and just got an email today saying, uh, we appreciate your recent recent purchase, but due to an unexpected delay, we now anticipate shipping this um, by July 21st to July 27th. Is this sort of the soft, not recall, starting to roll out already that they're working on the phones in the back room? It's hard to say. I mean, the, the phone is still crazily popular, even with all of this controversy over the antenna. So it may just be the supply chain experiencing a little more stress than they anticipated, or it could be some kind of delay from, or, from the fix. It's, or if it's they hard to are say. working on it. I mean, it's easier to work on phones that have not yet been released than to work Absolutely. on phones that are turned back in. And the recall. cost on this, I mean, it's just got to be unbelievable for mm -hmm. Apple. I mean, not that they aren't profiting wildly well, from the we'll phone. We'll see what they do. If they give everybody a $50 gift card and say, here, you can use this to buy a bumper, have at it, that's going to be less costly, actually less costly than the price change on the iPhone. Remember when they gave everybody 100 bucks? Oh, right. right. You know, so that fits the profile a little more than saying, oh, yeah, we'll take everybody's back, send it back. and we'll fix it. Or we'll, here, give us your address and we'll send you a uh, bottle of clear nail polish. Deal with it. Yeah. Apple does have a history of of making good on, or at least attempting to make good on these sorts of things, like a $100 gift and certificate. And regardless, mm -hmm. we, can, we can expect that they're going to be doing better than BP. <laughs> so, even with the recall. It's funny you would mention <laughs> BP because a New York senator who has been all up in BP's business mm -hmm. is now shifting his attention to Apple. Correct, Tom? Yep. Yes, Senator Charles Chuck Schumer on oh, Thursday boy. issued an open letter to Steve Jobs regarding the iPhone 4 antenna issues, calling Apple's current solutions insufficient and asking the company to provide a free fix for consumers because this is as an important thing that Congress people should. Why, why yeah, is he getting involved in this? this? We don't. I mean, he's not he, necessarily wrong. It's just we don't need a senator on this. Do we? I, I, well, see, I think it's interesting because he takes a very forward position on consumer issues, and he's done this throughout his entire career. I don't know if he's it's because he's from New York or he's just one of those guys. So I called his office to try and find out why this particular issue was such a big deal. They shockingly did not get back to me. But I have I was at GMA um I guess about six months ago and he was in the makeup chair next to me. And as I recall, he has a Blackberry. So it's not it's not, not a personal. personal. <laughs> yeah. All right. Good to know. But it's New York. There are a lot of constituents with iPhones. Also, uh, Bloomberg reporting that uh, Apple Incorporated senior antenna expert, one Ruben Caballero, informed Apple's management the device's design could hurt reception. Uh, and apparently was ignored or is now laughing all the way around the office going, I told you so, uh, but uh, they didn't do anything about it. And they, he isn't talking now. At least Apple won't let him talk. That's for sure. I have two thoughts on this. One, Steve Jobs was so bullish on the new antenna design that it's, you know, this is something that has been an, uh, an Achilles heel for the iPhone from the get-go was dropped calls. And so the idea, the premise of a fixed reception, a fixed reception with this external antenna, I bet that Jobs just had blinders on. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they're reporting this guy's name is Ruben Caballero. Si. Sandwich cowboy? <laughs> <laughs> Should we question this at all? <laughs> Corn beef sandwich cowboy. No. I just am a little, I just want to say, on I did rye. not notice that beforehand, so I would, I will go back no, and that try. poor guy probably got that all the way through elementary school. Uh, but I'm just making sure it's not What's a... Up, sandwich cowboy? <laughs> you know, Sandwich cowboy says there's a problem with the antenna, but you know I'm just making sure we're not getting, <laughs> um, we're not cowboy? getting 4chan on this, or this is some ridiculous... Hey, Sandwich cowboy tried to warn you. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, Apple oh. did uh, try to buy Palm, apparently, according to Business Insider, uh, and so did uh, Rim. Yeah, they said that there were 16 different companies uh, that were contacted about purchasing uh, Palm, five serious potential suitors. And you remember Palm was sold to HP for $1.2 billion, but Apple was mostly interested in Palm's IP and their patents. They have over 400 patents and 400 more applications on file. So that's what Apple was interested in. RIM um, said they had, the, you know, Business Insider says they had Palm in their hand and blew it big time. It, wow. Uh, Business Insider has a source on this, but they also went into the uh, file of the merger proxy with the SEC where companies are not identified by name, but they have to say what the companies did during the negotiations. And so there's a really interesting breakdown of like, 
For instance, Company A offered $600 million in cash but did not raise its bid. And Business Insider is like, mm, sounds like Apple to us. Uh, and Company D contacted Palm to discuss an intellectual property transaction but did not make a proposal to acquire Palm. Sounds like Google. And mm. Company C first wanted to acquire patent rights, then later tried to buy Palm as a whole. It originally offered 6 to $7 per share, but after more diligence, lowered its bid to five fifty. Sounds like Rim blowing it. <laughs> yes. What's that show where the, the girl sits on one side and then there are three unnamed bachelors on the other side? <laughs> That's what this is. Company and A, Company B. And remember, Apple tried to buy Palm way, way, way back. back. Um, oh, right. So back when this, 3Com still owned them. That's right. Yeah. But Steve Jobs rebuffed. So this might have been a, a trying to, to settle the score there, but not unsuccessful. There's a little undercurrent a of low, Google Apple fight going on there too. Yeah, but with a low ball bid, it seems interesting that they would put their you know bid into the ring, but then not do anything else about it. And if they were really interested in all those patents, that I think they're sniping. Yeah. They're just trying to drive up the <laughs> price for HP. Possibly, maybe. You know. Yeah, I mean it's also it's a bad economy. It's just like the real estate market right now. Everybody wants a deal. Yeah, that's you know? true too. We'll just put the money in and then uh, just see, it. Yeah. See, if you take see it. see if you can take it. Yeah. Yeah. Are you guys interested or fascinated with this Facebook movie? No. I cannot wait. <laughs> Kiki, so, okay, is, we know. Kiki is so over it and I can't wait because I love it when geeky stuff becomes every day. I, that's, that's what I, I, I think. It's just I keep looking at news about this movie and I'm honestly I said earlier I'm waiting for the punchline I'm waiting for this you know this this to just be like haha funny joke we didn't really make a movie but look at these cute trailers we made to dramatize stuff you know it's, it just I, I love yes that geeky stuff is making it into the mainstream but it just is so strange to me so this the, the movie will debut in October but the is that correct I think it's October yes. 1st or something and the the trailers have come out, but this is the most recent one, right, Eric? New trailer. New trailer. New Dramatic. Creepy. This idea is potentially worth millions of dollars. Millions? You stole our website. They're saying we stole the Facebook. I know what it said. So did we? A million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? A billion dollars. You're going to get left behind. It's moving faster than any of us ever imagined get left it went behind. Let's sue him in federal court. I can't wait to stand over your shoulder and what you write as a check. If you guys were the inventors of Facebook, that to Facebook. Is there anything that you need to tell me? Your actions could have permanently destroyed everything I've been working on. We have been working on. Did you like being a joke? Do you want to go back to that? Mark! Let's sue him in the appropriate court for this kind of suit. But if I say federal court, it's so much more dramatic. <laughs> I'm waiting for somebody to like stand on a table and do a mighty yop. You know, like it, this is Dead Poets Society, but for like the internet age. It's a I lot of money. Know. People yeah. care about this you know, entrepreneurial, college whiz kid, if there's Steals injury. idea. Yeah. It's, I think it's going to be great. I'm mm. excited. You know what's cooler than a million dollars, Becky? A I, billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> a kid in a hoodie sweating profusely thinking about a billion dollars. I have to say, it does have the Aaron Sorkin quotability already, even Mark! just from the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Let us shift our view now to the Southern Hemisphere and the state of New Zealand, uh, which has decided that software will now be unpatentable. The uh -oh. Honorable Simon Power announced today that he would not modify the proposed patents bill, meaning that software will be unpatentable once the bill passes into law. So I was really interested in this story, but it just I needed some context. So I called Denise Howell from This Week in Law, and she really helped me to understand this. So let me put this in its place. Software is unpatentable in New Zealand. Why is this important? Or will be once will this be. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. The EU has made the same decision. Basically, what they're saying is they're making a black and white decision saying, you know what, take your software and don't try and patent it because it's very confusing and we're not sure that how we will handle the patents for software. In the U.S., we have a different system. Basically, what the U.S. Patent and Trade Office has said is software is a gray area. If you create software that's amazing, that does something mind-bogglingly new, we will give you a patent for it. This is after the Bilski case. Before after the Bilski, Bilski case, the, if it, you could get a patent on almost anything. Right. Yeah. So Bilski came down a couple of two, three weeks ago, and basically they, the issue is, is something transformative happening within this product? And so already we're seeing that precedent impacting U.S. patents. And the bottom line is, 
we're going to decide on a case-by-case basis here in the U.S. In the EU and in New Zealand, they've said, meh, we don't care about your software. Don't bother us with it. Now, the, the New Zealand software houses like this because what they feel they can't innovate for fear of being sued by all the big software companies out there in the world, like Microsoft and others. Uh, and so this allows them to freely innovate without worrying about that because they don't have a big patent library of their own to battle with. That's what happens with the mm -hmm. big boys. There's a little game, a little Mexican standoff, you know, we're like, well, if you sue him, then Google's going to sue you and then RIM's going to sue you and then Qualcomm. So we're, nobody's going to sue anybody because we don't want to start this big war. Uh, in New Zealand now, they'll be free to do it. But will they be able to take that software and, to other countries like the United States, where we have the stricter law, even if it's less strict than it used to be, that's the question. I think you know, on a on a on a very clean cut interpretation, th this that's something that'll have to be decided when the cases come up, and hard to know if that'll be instigated by the patent companies who feel the companies in the U.S. who feel their patents have been infringed upon. But with downloads, it's a moot point. If you're a foreign software company and you worry about this at all, you'll exclusively make your software available for download and not have to worry about the physical... Or will we go into some ridiculous RIAA-type logic where they say, well, you need to geolocate if, when you, if you make your software available for download and not allow anyone who's from our country to download it because we Ugh. have the patent on it. Yeah, I'll believe that when I see it. I also think this is a good thing for patent trolls if mm -hmm. the, the problem of patent trolling, you know, for some of these smaller countries and who want to inspire innovation from their software makers. Also wanting to innovate is Clear Channel because they want to buy more radio stations. And so they have gone to the Federal Communications Commission and asked them to reconsider broadcast ownership rules and allow them to buy more radio stations per market. Right now there's a limit. I think it's eight radio stations per market, something like that. Uh, and Clear Channel says, look, the Internet exists right and there's an infinite number of audio stations that everyone in our local market can listen to so we're at a disadvantage if we can only own a certain amount of stations it's the point is moot just let us own however many we want because there's numberless choices out there now yeah local media has become such an interesting um arena because all of the fcc rules it's such they don't seem applicable and it's amazing how fast that happened it's amazing how fast the com how how companies try and jump on these uh, vagaries. So the FCC has to figure has to figure some things out before being able to answer Clear Channel's request. They have to figure out what is the is there a difference between terrestrial radio, local radio, and internet radio? Would there be a difference? I mean, because true with the internet, you can pretty as as many names as you can come up with. There are potential stations, but that's not true for the number of frequencies that are available in terrestrial radio. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe there is some kind of a yeah, you know, some kind of a, a special uh, s special special grant that they get, can, can be given to Clear Channel for buying as many internet radio stations as they want, but not terrestrial radio mm -hmm. stations. My perception is they own all the radio stations anyways. anyway. Right. Aren't these the people who <laughs> pipe Ryan Seacrest onto every station that I listen to? Yes. I mean, not yes. saying that I only listen to pop. That's completely insipid and, and vapid, at but I do. At present, uh, Clear Channel owns 857 signals or 5.9% of the nation's 14,400 free over-the-air radio licenses. So hmm. they definitely come off as owning a lot more than they already do. Well, because they own 74% of the, of the market share, of the revenue, rather, in every territory. Because they have the most listened to stations. Yeah, they've got the big ones. Yeah. Right. The, yeah, it's the, the, it's the, the college stations, the Christian stations, the little tiny ones at the end of the, the Tejano dial. The Tejano stations. Tejano. Mm -hmm. Z. The, the one station that just broadcasts podcasts. <laughs> really? On AM radio <laughs> out of the East Bay. Right. That's right. Or, yeah. Although that was actually that part of Clear Channel, I think. Hmm. It was either part of Clear. No, you, that one was part of CBS radio. Because CBS, wow. CBS Radio owns that. a ton of stations, too. They're one of the biggies. They so. are huge. Yep. Uh, the question is, what is radio at this point? And, and mm -hmm. all of these stations are streamed on the Internet as well. So I, I feel like they have a bit of a point, which is, what's the, what, you know, why limit it? But until everyone can listen to Internet radio, I don't yeah. think you can make these decisions based on the Internet. Right now, no. people driving around their cars, people sitting in their houses... They can't listen to internet radio as easily as they can listen to over-the-air radio. Yep. Eventually, that will reach parity. And when it does, then I think they have a point. But I think it's a little early. I, I don't. doesn't surprise me that they're going to make this argument as soon as they can. But, but there will always be 
I believe there will always be local radio. The radio frequencies that are that are used, those will if if everything goes to internet and you have internet radio in your cars, there are still going to be people who are broadcasting on terrestrial radio stations and people who are picking that up with old school radio tuners. You know, receivers. I think we'll get rid of that. Actually, I think we'll lose those bro- those Not those completely. airwaves. will want to will want yep. to give those over to other wireless broadcasting and I don't know. wireless internet will be radio yeah and then you get hyper local stuff hyper local and and that and and then you still run into the question of how much of the market share do you want owned by any one corporation it becomes a trickier problem then because market share be, it, it can it is based on influence not on licenses because there's an unlimited number of internet radio licenses yeah. and yeah. so you can't control it as easily it's an interesting, an interesting conversation. And, and question. local radio, I think people react to and relate to mm-hmm. at a very visceral level. And I think it's, it, it would be very, um, I think it, it'd go kicking and screaming in the end. But <laughs> in ten or twenty years, fifteen, who knows? Yeah. Meanwhile, in Tokyo, they're living in the future because <laughs> that's just what they do in Japan. And the AFP is reporting digital billboards in Tokyo are scanning people's age and gender. To tailor an advertising message just for their demographic. Hmm. They know where you are. They know who you are. Eleven railway companies are participating in the digital signage promotion project uh, that just as you walk past can distinguish a person's sex and approximate age, kind of like the Microsoft Connect, (laughs) uh, and then give you the appropriate advertisement. Uh, You guys feel like that's creepy or who cares? Well, I, as long as they're not necessarily getting personal information about you, I mean, there are cameras all over the place, and they're just using, you know, general recognition algorithms to determine sex or height or weight or whatever is noticeable by anybody else on the street, right. and delivering an advertisement that is suited to those potential characteristics. What if it went beyond, so, no. you know, your gender and your age? What if it recognized your body type and assessed your, your BMI and said, you need to be on Activia weight loss? What? I mean, <laughs> that, yeah. gets, that gets into a little bit of privacy and like, well, wait, hold on. Is this really, do you want a billboard yelling <laughs> personal <laughs> messages at you? Hey, you, Tom, shave well, I, your beard. I'm looking at the... Uh, <laughs> Use this new big razor, Gillette. Uh, I'm looking. I'm looking at the first time somebody walks up to a billboard, and all of a sudden, it's advertising depends at them, and you're like, "Hey, wait <laughs> that a minute! Is not cool. First of all, not that old. You're wrong. You're wrong, algorithm." <laughs> I mean, I think about being a 13 year old girl and watching some ad come on for you know, it keeps you fresh, and my dad's sitting on the couch next to me, and we're watching TV, and you're ah! like, "No!" So I can't even imagine if you're with total strangers and if it was something you'd you'd have to be have restraint as an advertiser. I already yeah. feel a little bit of this when I watch television programs sometimes and all of a sudden they're advertising like children's toys and I'm like, is this a kiddie program that I'm watching? <laughs> like these ads aren't targeted at me. Why am I watching Merlin? I don't, what, what's going on here? You're making an assessment about my maturity. <laughs> yes. Oh, goodness. Finally, a Solution to the problem of slow charging batteries, yes. graphene enhanced lithium ion batteries, where they use my favorite new material, graphene, on the terminals, which allows for superconducting, meaning the uh, the charge can get in faster, right? Right, right. It can conduct more ions into the battery faster. So it doesn't hurt capacity. It used to be you had to choose one or the other. You can charge faster, but your capacity is low. Or you can have a high capacity battery, but it's going to take days to to recharge. Right. But these rechargeable batteries can give you the best of both worlds. Yes. And this has been tested by a a company called, what is the name of the company? Called Vorbeck Materials along uh, in conjunction. Vorbeck. Vorbeck in conjunction with Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, And they have uh, pretty much, uh, they've, demonstrated proof of concept that this does work. They are charging lithium ion batteries faster than they ever had been, been have before. And the the great thing about graphene is it's low cost, it's large capacity, chemical stability, and it's environmentally friendly. We use it, it's pencils, it's carbon. Mm, it's yep. it's great stuff. Um and it boosts the electrical conductivity a lot. I think this in conjunction with the story you talked about the other day where um, the Volt, their battery will be guaranteed for 100,000 miles. 
I think, you know, mm. we're really looking at innovation in batteries. That's the thing that's holding back electric vehicles. Yes. And I think people are concerned and they were concerned when hybrids came out about the longevity of batteries. So if we can increase recharge times and mm. guarantee long life, we're looking at something that's really going to push EVs over the edge. That's going to be a tipping point technically. Finally, we don't have a lot of time for this story, but Old Spice Guy is <laughs> kicking it virally uh, with all of the 180 plus videos he's made tailored to various people on the internet. 5.9 million video views with 22,500 comments. It's it it took a lot to over to overcome the double rainbow meme, but Old Spice Man has done it, and has to be one of the most genius social media marketing campaigns of all time. And we have to say, O Docta. Oh my God! Right on his heels. Search O Docta O H D O C T A H Old Spice, and you'll find out why he's going to take down the Old Spice guy. That's and nice. he's going to bring man boobs to a whole new level. It was and pink impressive. bathrooms. Yes, pink, yes. Bathrooms. Pink bathrooms. We're just teasing you to it, but it's worth the search. It's worth the look. All right, we got a new segment we're going to try out here on Tech News today. We'd like to hear your comments on whether you like it or not. There's a lot of stories we don't have time to get to every day, uh, but we're going to try to throw them at you really quickly in a, uh, a sort of a lightning round. So here we go. DNSSEC has long been promoted as a way to stop domain name hijacking. Then the DNSSEC initiative passed an important milestone today. ICANN published the Root Zone Trust Anchor, allowing internet root servers to begin issuing certificates verifying who they are to the other root operators. This marks the completion of the signing of the Root Zone meaning that all root operators are now involved in the exchange of valid certificates, meaning secure domain names for you. A uh, recent survey of over 4,000 consumers says 16% of respondents plan to buy a smartphone within the next 90 days. Biggest increase in the survey's history, Apple and HTC both improving their share by over 50%. This is all done between March and June, so hard to know how the iPhone 4 problems will impact the results. But RIM and Motorola both had their share fall in that same time span. Palm didn't register a single percentage point in interest. Mobile ad network Millennial Media, which claims that its network reaches 82% of 72 million mobile web users in the U.S., is reporting that globally, Apple iOS requests are up by 36% in June after dropping 33% in May. Android requests continue to rise and grew another 23% month over month. Uh, Apple rumor report, Apple prepping a smaller MacBook Air, again, rumors, it's going to be based on the A4 and the iPod Touch with FaceTime, also rumored. And one of the uh, things that they say will happen is that FaceTime calls will be based on email addresses, not phone numbers. Finally, Hewlett Packard is working on a variety of tablet PCs, running a variety of operating systems, among them an Android device that was supposed to arrive to market in the fourth quarter. But sources now and say to All Things D, that HP Android tablet has been tabled. You'll still see a Windows 7 tablet, probably a WebOS tablet but no Android tablet. That's them doubling down on the web OS, I think. All right, so that's how we do with the, with the lightning round. Let us know what you think. That's how we do. TNT at twit.tv. <laughs> On to the calendar. Uh, Hulu Plus coming early to select PlayStation 3 users. Hulu Plus has generally been seen as a, uh, a promising beta for the expanded service. Um, you pay $9.95 a month. So that will be coming early to select PlayStation 3 users. Um, now, Tom, you put this in here. OpenSUSE 11.3 here? Yep. It's a new version of, of OpenSUSE Linux, and it's got free over-the-internet syncing, a free audio editing tool in it, improved indexing, and the new versions of Firefox and Thunderbird. So just a, a little marker that it's out today. Good to know. On to the voicemails. Our uh, first caller will speak for himself, because I can't remember what his call is about. <laughs> hey, guys. Love the show. Uh, I have a question about the peer-to-peer -peer things that you were talking about on the show yesterday. Why don't all the music and movie organizations get together and make one unified website for peer-to-peer -peer copyright violators to come clean? They could volunteer personal information and pay $5 per song or $20 per movie, for example. A website like that could save millions or billions in prosecution costs for the recording industries. It would also, um, they would also have your information so that they could track your future use. Artists would get paid as much or more than they would on iTunes. Uh, people would stop having dreams the SWAT team is busting down their door. And if the word spread, everybody could pay up rather than having thousands or hundreds of thousands of users escaping prosecution. Bill Manti, Wisconsin. Thanks. I think Strike It Rich in the chat room put it uh, best. Because no one will voluntarily do this. I, yep. I'm, I kind of think that... 
I disagree. Really? Because I think amnesty is a concept that plays well with people. You're offering the opportunity to make it right. And even if it, if it costs a nominal fee, I think there are people who might just say, okay, if I'm worried about it, yeah, I was, this is my chance to do something different. I think the uh, the the things that he put in there about like, and then you give him all your in personal information so they can track <laughs> uh -huh. you, it needs to be either toned down or removed because that's going to scare a lot of people away. But I, I think you're onto something there with the an idea of amnesty. I think so, but at the same time, there are there's there's evidence from all sorts of other amnesty type programs. There are lots of people who will not trust the system no matter what, and there will not there will be a large proportion of people who will. To opt out. This whole thing from the RIAA and the record companies, it's a PR stunt to get people to recognize that they don't want you to do this type of file sharing, that it's wrong, whatever words you want to put on it. So this would be a Please means. Please let us make all of our money. Right. I mean, <laughs> this would be a means for them to get their message out, probably in a much less expensive way than the millions they're paying to lawyers. Yeah. So you would turn in your pirated MP3s and get stuffed animals? <laughs> You know what? I, being the Catholic that I am, I would just go. Forgive me, R I W A, for I have sinned. My penance is five bucks. Now I can die happy. And five hail marys. There you go. Our next caller. Uh, we talked yesterday actually about the rumors that folks were getting new iPhones that were fixed that didn't have the antenna problem. And our next caller had that very experience. Hey guys, this is Quinn from Salt Lake City. Just calling back about the uh, Gizmodo kind of iPhone silent recall replacement issue, all that big ordeal. And uh, I will say that I believe it's true. Um, I went into my Apple store today to get my phone replaced due to proximity sensor issues. They didn't even ask what the problem was. They just took it right back and brought me a new one out. And I will tell you that the new phone, I can't get the death grip to do anything. Um, I've tried for about 10 minutes and it won't budge a single bar. So I don't know if they fixed it. I don't know what the deal is, but uh, it's definitely different. So keep up the good work. Love the show. See you later. Now, if Quinn's experience is not some fluke, they could lend credence to the idea that there would be an exchange program where you could just come in and say, hey, I bought an original iPhone 4, give me, an, give me a fixed one, and there's some coding on it or something. There are all kinds of theories rolling around and ideas about how a non-recall could work. My favorite one is that you take the Livestrong um, bands and you yep. send them out to everybody and give the proceeds to the Livestrong <laughs> Foundation. I think that's brilliant. Or a red one for inspiring. Having, having done that with a Nerdtacular 2010 band, uh, you have to cut your own openings in those uh. to make it work. And if you're not careful when you're cutting an opening for the little mute button thing, it snaps. That's not Oops. good. Yeah. Okay. On to the emails. Dr. Kiki, if you would be so kind as to lead us off. That's right. That New York Daily News article was deplorable. I guess that's what happens when you fire your science writers. Or I, this is not from the letter, but I would say, or just don't do a science story on a day when I'm here. Uh, here's the real scoop. And they have a link from Science Blogs. Love, love the show, Horse. Now, the link that goes to Science Blogs is written by PZ Myers uh, at Feringula. Um, he's an evolutionary uh, scientist and he puts it straight. Basically, the MSNBC article just had it all wrong. It was, a, you know, a, it was a title that garnered attention, but at the same time, the, the, the real question, this question is why are we even asking this question anymore? Wait, so, the, really? so we don't know the really? chickens came first? We the chick the eggs definitely we had we had uh, we had dinosaurs we had reptiles dinosaurs laid right but eggs. which came we first the reptiles. chicken or the egg <laughs> yeah exactly okay <laughs> because it crossed the road <laughs> obviously that the was the road runner me, me. oh yeah so <sighs> philosophically it's an interesting but what you're saying is there can't be a scientific answer to chicken egg because they and, don't that doesn't work that way and and specifically with this they were talking about chickens and this molecule called ovocleiden but there's different different molecules used by different birds that came before or at the same time as chickens and it just happened that one particular type of animal that ended up being a chicken evolved this particular molecule that helped to attach calcium to this to make the eggshell hard and there are other molecules that do that and you can find them all through the animal kingdom even to um worms c elegans 
Which came first, the worm or the chicken? Ah, the worm. The early oh, see, bird. there's one we can answer. <laughs> the <worm>. Thank goodness. <laughs> On to Amanda, who says, Hi, TNT. I came across the test below a little while ago during a debate with a friend. It's on a dating site, but you don't need to be a member to take it. It was the top Google result when we searched nerd geek dork test <laughs> i'm not saying this is the canonical test but it worked for us and it was fun uh she puts the link in the email at okcupid.com it gives you your percentage that you fit each label and we thought it was pretty accurate thought you might be interested mandy the 82 percent nerd 52 50 questions tom what are your what are your results? My results: sixty five percent nerd. Now this is on a one to a hundred scale in each one, so I'm sixty five percent on the way to being a hundred percent nerd. See, I would 70, see. Wait, can I just guess one thing? Yeah, I would see you as being epically high on the geek scale. Seventy four percent geek. That's pretty good. Three and thirty percent dork. Yeah, you're not a dork. A third well, dork. Thirty percent dork. <laughs> no, but that's low. There, yeah. That's you're lower dork than me. And what was your what was your? Uh, I was forty three percent dork. <laughs> I'm 48% geek, wow, but see, you, you kill me on the geek spectrum because of your comic involvement. Ah, uh, maybe. You're much yeah. more... Um, obsessive. Obsessive about... <laughs> you have single focus yeah. on things that are traditionally um, geek-oriented. What was your nerd rating, though? 75%. Oh, see, yeah, there we go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Did you guys take the uh, test? I have three more questions. <laughs> it's All not right. a short-term investment of time. But Eric, it is. Eric definitely got a, got a low dork rating because he didn't even take the test. Right. <laughs> so This is interesting. Nerd, passionate about learning. Geek, passionate about one particular area. Dork, someone who has difficulty with social interactions. Yeah. That's us taking the test. Yes. Finished. Oh, and what's your? Oh, you, now you got to do now a bunch of do stuff something. to yeah, get your results. Nice try. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and read our last email while we while we see if you can get uh, your results. Let's see. This is me. Hi, TNT crew. I was wondering if the laser hair removal that Tom used on his arm actually worked. From Dave in Costa Mesa, California. Wow, somebody who watched our first episode. Yay, Dave gets points. Um, now, no. Inspection. Yeah, there's there's plenty of hair there. Well, okay, that's because. You did not keep up with the regimen, Tom. Oh, so it doesn't work once. You don't just do it once. You got to keep repeating it. Yes, every. You well, I would say you didn't keep up with the regimen. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to bring this every six weeks. Zap me, yeah. Oh, all you have to do is ask. <laughs> no problem. Should we do the? Should we do all the sensitive areas? Yes, we should. Ooh. Okay, just check live on the show. <laughs> Ooh, wow. That'll, that'll kill ratings. It's a three to four. Um, you have to do it every six weeks, three to four times. You shave the area first, then you laser flash it. And then you do it six weeks later. Everyone's saying it was the other arm. Other arm looks exactly the same <laughs> as this one. You can't tell the difference. White and hairy. If they weren't attached, I'd probably get them confused all the time. <laughs> are you almost Are you almost there? No, she's not even close. No. All right. I'm well, thanks, trying. everybody, for watching the show. Uh, you can look in Dr. Kiki's Twitter feed for her, her percentages. That's and right. uh, we will be available by phone at 260-TNT-SHOW, 24 hours a day. Our operators in Butler, Indiana, are standing by. And, and we should let people know that uh, the Twit group will be updating you tomorrow as the events unfold from the Apple Press Conference. Live at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Email address is TNT at twit.tv, and you can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. See you tomorrow. Bye.